This will be our first discussion about protein structure. And I think this is when the class really starts to get interesting. Previous to this, we've really just been talking about um, isolated molecules and, and we discussed amino acids and how the individual amino acids can connect together and form a peptide bond and then the, they make longer chains. Um, but now we're really gonna to look into these longer chains, these protein chains, and see how they they fold and, and what kind of structures they have. And there's a big relationship in proteins with their structure and their function. Um, and so this is the first time we're really looking at bio macromolecules, uh, which are uh, really the important part uh, in, of in in biochemistry, these these larger macromolecules. Okay. And the title slide shows a piece of art that's on uh, the Oregon State campus. Uh, I believe the house uh, Linus Pauling lived in, I'm not 100% sure, um, but Linus Pauling taught at Oregon State and he discovered the alpha helix, uh, one of the things he did, uh, actually winning the Nobel Prize for some of his work. Uh, and so that's what this, this statue is commemorating. And he was a, a very interesting um, scientist and I'll we'll mention a little bit more about him uh, at, at the end of the, the lecture. Right. So the material from today is the material, uh, it's from chapter four. Okay, the first section of chapter four is an overview of protein structure, and the second section is dealing with specifically with second, what we call secondary structure, and we're, we're, we'll introduce uh, a couple secondary structures that will be um, important. Okay. So proteins, as I've alluded to before in lectures, they, f they have a, a specific three-dimensional conformation, a specific, what we call a, a fold, okay? Um, and that's important because the shape of a pro protein, the structure of a protein, allows it to fulfill a specific function. Okay? There's a relationship between structure and function. Uh, you might hear it referred to as uh, a native fold, a, a protein structure might, you might hear that referred to as a fold or a native fold sometimes. Okay. And what the, the native term really means that it's in its natural state uh, as it would be inside of a cell. Okay. If you're studying proteins in a lab and you take them out of the cell uh, in, in vitro, they can unfold uh, either completely or partially and then they would especially if it's partially unfolded it would still have some sort of structure it just it wouldn't be its native structure okay so that's what that term native means okay. this native protein structure native fold has a large number of favorable interactions inside the protein and that's not surprising uh, we've mentioned this before um, at least in the introductory uh, lecture for the class there's a huge entropy cost for pr folding a protein. Protein that's in a random uh, chain, random coil of amino acids has a, a high degree of entropy, a high degree of freedom. Once it folds into one specific structure, there's a lot less freedom there, okay? And that, that's, that has a huge cost uh, entropically Okay, so to offset that, there's a large number of favorable interactions inside a, of a protein that's folded. And those favorable interactions are listed here. The three most important ones to remember are the hydrophobic effect, hydrogen bonds, and electrostatic interactions. Okay, and we'll, we've talked about at least two of these before. Okay, the hydrophobic effect, remember that's when you have a, a hydrophobic molecule in water, and water makes a very ordered cage around it. So in a protein, if you have hydrophobic amino acids that are exposed to water, there's very ordered water molecules around them. 
But when that protein folds and those hydrophobic amino acids get buried, water is driven out, and then that water gains a lot more freedom, a lot more motion, and that that is an increase of entropy of the water molecules, a, a big increase. So that offsets the, the entropy lost by the protein when it folds. Right? And that's the, the basis of the hydrophobic effect. Okay. Hydrogen bonds also very important. Okay, the interaction of hydrogens on uh, the amino group and the oxygen and the carbonyl of the, the peptide bond, those are what lead, primarily what lead to the secondary structures, alpha helix and, and beta sheet. Okay, so the, the hydrogen bonding between the backbone, the peptide backbone, is what leads to these secondary structures. Um, London dispersion forces, we don't really talk a whole lot about, so um, I think you don't need to know, need know a whole lot about that. Okay. Uh, the other important one is electrostatic interactions. Those are longer range interactions between amino acids that are permanently charged. So the if you think back to the the two positively or three positively charged amino acid side chains and the two negatively charged, those would be um, involved in these electrostatic interactions primarily. Okay. In when you have a an interaction between a positive charge and a negative charge in a protein, we call those salt bridges. Okay, and those help stabilize the the stru uh, structure of the protein, and especially when those occur the electrostatic interactions occur when they're on the inside in the hydrophobic environment of the protein. They strongly stabilize it. There are four levels of protein structure. And the, this figure it does a, a pretty decent job at explaining what these mean. Okay, so the first one is called primary structure. And primary structure is just the the sequence of amino acids, how they, they, they're connected to each other. Okay, so we would, we would maybe call that um, a, a first dimension, I guess. Right? So in this case, we have this sequence of amino acids, right? proline, alanine, uh, spartic acid, lysine, and so on. Okay, that the order in which they come in the chain, that would be the primary structure. Uh, secondary structure and here it's an, an alpha helix, and we'll talk about a lot more about that in detail. Okay, that would be a, an example of a secondary structure. That's how a chain, right? So these amino acids in the chain go to form this alpha helix. You'll notice that it's it's a secondary structure, but it has a three-dimensional shape. Right? So that's one thing to, to kind of remember that a secondary structure still has a three-dimensional shape, okay? but what we're really referring to is what pattern does that amino acid chain follow? Okay? And in this case, it's following a, a bend, uh, a helical bend. Okay. Okay, the next level is tertiary structure. In tertiary structure, you can think of as a completely folded protein. And another way to, to differentiate between a secondary structure and a tertiary structure, in a tertiary structure, you might have this, this alpha helix, right? This is where we're, we're going from the primary structure to the secondary structure. Okay, and this alpha helix in the tertiary structure is located right here. Okay. It in the tertiary structure, this uh, this alpha helix and the amino acids in that alpha helix might be very very close to let's say this uh, alpha helix and an amino acid right here. Okay, they might be close three dimensionally in that tertiary structure, but this amino acid might be hundreds and hundreds of amino acids away from these amino acids in the primary structure, okay? So 
if something that's close in in the tertiary structure might not be close in the primary structure this really is um, how the entire protein folds and, and fits together there's another level of structure that might be a little bit confusing and that's a qu quaternary structure i always have trouble pronouncing that um, this is when you have multiple protein subunits that interact with one another and come together to form a, a complex. Okay. So in this case, and this is hemoglobin, we'll be looking at that more in detail uh, in, in a few lectures. So you have completely, so a complete amino acid chain that's folded into a three-dimensional shape. Okay. Four of those come together and form this complex in hemoglobin. Okay. So that would be an example of a, a, a quad, <laughs> quad, quaternary structure. Okay. You also sometimes see these referred to as you know, first degree or primary structure, second degree or secondary structure, third degree or th tertiary, and fourth degree or quad quaternary. Okay, so primary structure. It, it, this really focuses on the, the peptide bond. The, the peptide bond itself is in resonance. It has a resonance structure. And because of that, the peptide bond is quite rigid. There's no rotation around it. Uh, and it, it, it makes basically a, a plane. And we'll see a figure of this here in a second. It's also, it also has a dipole, and it favors a trans conformation. So here's how we would draw a, a normal peptide bond, right? Here's the carbonyl and the uh, amino group, but of two different amino acids, right? Here's the first alpha carbon, here's the second alpha carbon. Okay, they connect together to form that, that peptide bond. You can draw a resonance structure of this. And if I can get my pen out. All right, so you could have a case, whoops, that was a poor resonance structure. Right, so you can think back to organic chemistry. That bond can move down. Or actually, I'm really, really fucking this up here. Okay. Got too excited. So it's these guys on the nitrogen can move over and those electrons on oxygen can move up making the negative charge on oxygen and the positive charge on nitrogen. Okay. And so those are the resonance structures, um, important resonance structures with the peptide bond. Um, this guy, uh, not important because it's, I don't think this is a, a major um, contributor because you have a negative charge on one atom and then the next atom right next to it there's a positive charge and that's not really um, uh, very favorable okay so when we're talking about the resonance on a peptide bond these are the important structures okay, okay. because of that resonance their rotation around that bond is not permitted okay so Right, because 
this bond here, this peptide bond has some partial double bond character, there's no rotation around that bond. Rotation around the bonds connected to the alpha carbon, these bonds are permitted. Okay. And we call, there's a, a two distinguishers. Okay. One is phi, the Greek, and, and it's, uh, the symbol for it is the Greek letter phi. And that's the angle around the alpha carbon amide nitrogen bond. And then there's psi, so phi and psi, they, they rhyme. Okay. And that is the other alpha carbon connected to the carbonyl carbon. Okay. A fully extended polypeptide, both of those, those phi and psi bonds are, would be 180 degrees. So you can use these these angles to describe the, the shape and the and the structure of this protein chain, the peptide chain. And here's a figure showing where these bond angles are located. Right. Um, and you're using it's a dihedral angle, so you're using the R group. Uh, and in this case, it'd be the R group to the carbonyl double bond. And in the, the case of the, the phi, it would be R group to that, that hydrogen on the, the amide nitrogen. Okay. All right. What else is important here? I, the bond length's probably not really that important to, to note. Uh, the the fact that these are planar and they're in the trans configuration, these peptide bonds. Okay, so when we say trans conformation, we're talking about this general pattern. Okay, and those are like rigid planes. Some phi and psi. Uh, Conformations are very favorable uh, because there are, there's crowding, what's known as steric crowding of these atoms in the backbone, the peptide backbone, um, with other backbone atoms or with atoms that are in the side chain. Okay, so some phi and psi combinations are more favorable because there's a chance of favorable hydrogen bonding interactions along the backbone at those angles. Okay. Right. So some are sort of forbidden and others are um, more prevalent because of these favorable interactions. And we can write these out or plot these out and show them graphically. And that's this Ramachandran plot. Okay. And this is a plot of the distribution of these these angles found in a protein. And when you do this, it shows some common secondary structure elements. And you can, can map out the regions where these secondary structures would occur on this plot. Okay, and it would also, when you do this, it would also reveal regions that have some unusual structures in them. Okay. So here's an example of that. Okay, we have phi and, and psi, so phi is on the x-axis in this case, and, and psi is on the, the y-axis. Okay, and where there's color, the blue color, that's uh, angles that are, are allowed. Okay, um, the other angles that are in white would sort of we would sort of refer to that as uh, forbidden, although you can still see some some small instances uh, depending on the exact environment there but for the most part those are, are unfavorable regions okay. and some secondary structures are shown in, in these specific areas on the the Ramachandran plot okay. um, beta sheets are up in this region okay. we'll talk more about what these actually mean but anti-parallel uh, parallel uh, 
write twisted beta sheets, which I don't think we'll really mention those. Um, collagen, triple helix. Uh, not going to mention that today, possibly next lecture. Okay, a left-handed helix is way out here, sort of on its own. And then the right-handed alpha helix is down here. Okay, so basic uh, remembering where these basic areas are on a plot would be helpful. Okay, and here's what some data, these dots are different angles in a protein. Um, this is what that would look like if you plotted out some angles. And I forget exactly what protein this is. But you see that that the a lot of the protein is falling in this alpha helical region, and then there's some others up here in the in the beta sheet region, and then any other region that's sort of in, intermediate of those, we would sort of just refer to as kind of random random coil. Okay, that brings us to our discussion of secondary structures, okay, and that. I think leads in sort of nicely. Okay. Secondary structure is referring to a local spatial arrangement of the backbone of a, a protein or polypeptide. There's really two main secondary structures that we discuss. One's the alpha helix and two is the beta sheet. Okay. Alpha helix is stable, stabilized by hydrogen bonds between nearby residues. So it's it's residues that are close by in, in primary sequence. A beta sheet is stabilized by hydrogen bonds between adjacent segments that may or may not be nearby. Okay, so a beta sheet can form between um, amino acids that are, are very distant in primary structure. An irregular arrangement of polypep of the polypeptide chain, that's what's referred to as a random coil. Right? Typically, random coil, we, we also kind of think of in a protein, a random coil has the ability to, to, to bend and move a, a little bit. There's a, there might be a little bit more motion associated in a, in a random coil region in a protein, although not, not necessarily. If we look at a table, okay, we can get some common phi and psi angles for these secondary structures. Okay. So an alpha helix, right, negative 57 uh, phi and negative 47 psi. Okay. Uh, beta conformation, either anti-parallel or parallel, okay, the phi is going to be negative, um, you know, basically double that of an alpha helix, and the psi in this case is going to be a positive value, right? So that's how you can really tell those two apart, okay? Uh, beta conformation, you have negative phi and positive psi, and alpha helix, they're negative on both. Okay. There's other types too, um, the triple helix and um, the, some beta turns are shown here. Um, it might be good to sort of know the beta turns uh, well because we're going to discuss those. The triple helix really is a three helix is kind of wrapped together. And that's a, um, an, a topic for a, an, another time. Okay. So let's look at the first secondary structure, the alpha helix. And in the alpha helix, what you'll notice, you, these hydrogen bonds, okay, that are stabilizing it between the, the amide nitrogen and the, the carbonyl oxygen, they're occurring regularly between an amino acid and one that is four more amino acids away in primary sequence. Okay, so when in an alpha helix you have this this hydrogen bonding between, and we we call that first amino acid N, and then the 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 next one that it's hydrogen bonding to N plus plus four. 
it's a right-handed helix, which we'll expl I'll explain in a second. Okay, and if you if you just follow it through one turn, that one turn contains 3.6 amino acid residues, and it has a, a height of 5.4 angstroms per turn. Okay, so th that's those are two uh, characteristics of the alpha helix you'll want to remember. All right, the fact that you have hydrogen bonding between N and N plus four amino acids, and that one turn of a helix, you have 3.6 amino acids in that turn, and it's 5.4 angstroms uh, per turn. The peptide bonds are aligned fairly parallel with the axis. And the side chains are pointing out. And the side chains don't point in, they never point into the inside of that helix, they always point out. Okay. How can you tell if, it, if something's right-handed or left-handed helix? Well, if you curl your fingers uh, like, a, like the helix, uh, the direction the helix is going, the, if you follow that helix around, the direction you're going your thumb should be pointing that direction, right? So this, if you just kind of do this with your hands, you can see the difference. One would be left-handed and the other would be right-handed. Okay. So this is the figure we saw and, and, and talked about. Right. If you look at a, a model of an alpha helix, so this would be a ball and stick model, right? This shows it looks like it's forming a channel, although with if you actually fill do a face a space filling model, those interior atoms here really fill up that interior space of the helix, so there's really not much room in there for anything to to get in. Okay, um, but you'll notice the side chains here in purple are all pointing to the outside. One way scientists, biochemists, represent alpha helices is by using a diagram like this. Okay. And by doing that, if you, uh, you can color the amino acids based on what side chain they have and, and get an idea of uh, the properties, the overall properties of a, an alpha helix. So here at position one, we have a positive charged amino acid. Two, that would be a hydrophobic in yellow, and three, Four is a negatively charged amino acid, okay, and then so forth. But what you can see here is if you have an amino acid that's positively charged and one that's uh, a few positions away, that negative charge now is very close to the positive charge. So that could be a stabilizing interaction in this helix. The other thing you can notice is that this side of the alpha helix are all hydrophobic residues. So you can have an alpha helix and have one face of the alpha helix be hydrophobic and the other face be um, polar or um, charged. And if that happens, you can, and you, you look at a helix and you see that pattern, you can sort of picture that this part of the helix is probably facing the inside of the protein and, and buried and shielded away from water. And this would be facing the outside and interacting with water. Okay. Yeah, this is um, some text, basically just what I've been mentioning on that, that slide. Okay. Um, the inner di diameter of the helix is uh, five, four to five angstroms. Um, that's really too small for anything to fit inside. Outer diameter of a helix is about 10 to 12 angstroms. Okay, that's um, with side chains. That happens to fit well into the major groove of double-stranded DNA. Okay, so we'll, um, at another point in, in biochemistry, we kind of deal with that. Okay, uh, proteins that interact with double-stranded DNA. Amino acids one and eight in a helix align very nicely on top of each other. So I should point that out as well. So if we look at this diagram, 
right? One amino acid one and amino acid eight are aligning very well together. Okay. Right, and I mentioned there an alpha helix with one face of it being hydrophobic, that that really tells you that it's interacting either on the inside of a protein or you can have some instances where uh, a helix that has hydrophobic face to it, it, that face is interacting with a membrane. Right. Sequences affect the stability of an alpha helix. Okay. Not all sequences adopt alpha helical structures. Small hydrophobic residues like alanine and leucine those are strong helix formers. Proline is a, a big time helix breaker. And that's because proline doesn't have rotation around that, that nitrogen uh, alpha carbon dihedral angle, the, the phi angle. Um, you remember the structure of proline, it, it's, it's forming a, a ring structure with that, that backbone so there's no rotation there. So that angle um, that it takes to make an alpha helix is impossible. Okay, so that prolines break an alpha helix. Glycine also is not very good in alpha helix uh, in, an, in an alpha helix because it has such a small R group, it can support uh, many different conformations and, and other conformations or or tend to be more favorable with, with glycine. Okay, so the ones to remember, al alanine and leucine, good for alpha helix, proline and glycine are, are bad, okay, especially proline. proline. Okay. Attractive or repulsive interactions between uh, chains that are three to four amino acids apart will, will also affect the formation. Uh, we saw the example of a, a positive and negative amino acid being, you know, three or four amino acids apart ha having a good effect on the alpha helix formation. You can imagine if you had two positively charged amino acids that distance apart or two negatively charged, they're going to repel each other and that, that might disrupt an alpha helix. Okay. This table, not, not super important, but it just shows you in a delta G way, it, it shows you, is this amino acid good at, at forming an alpha helix? So alanine is one of the better ones. It's at zero um, kilojoules per mole. And then all the rest are going to be a, a positive value. And proline is the worst. It has the highest, which is over four. Alpha helices have uh, a very strong overall dipole. And if you look at a peptide bond, a peptide bond has a, a pretty strong dipole. You have a carbonyl that's sort of the negative end and an amide hydrogen, which is would be the positive end. Okay. All peptide bonds in alpha helix are in a similar orientation facing a similar direction. And that gives an alpha helix a large macroscopic dipole moment. Okay. And this is enhanced by unpaired amides and carbonyls near the ends of the helix. And we'll look at a figure that explains that. Okay. Negatively charged residues often occur near the positive end of the helix dipole. Okay. So if we have a, let's go this way. If we have an alpha helix, right? Remember we have, and these these gray positive and negatives are between, they're indicating this is the, the amide nitrogen and that's the carbonyl oxygen, right? So you, you have these blue dashed lines, which are hydrogen bonds, okay? All right, so th that's the same uh, going up and down this alpha helix. But what you'll notice is that on this side of the alpha helix, you have these negative, partial negatively charged 
areas that are on carbonyl oxygens that aren't hydrogen bonded to uh, a, a nitrogen, right? Because this is the end of the alpha helix. There's the structure after this does not form a helix. Okay, or I should say this is the beginning of the alpha helix. Um, and these are not forming hydrogen bonds. So those negative charges aren't shielded. Okay. And likewise, on this side, these amide nitrogens aren't forming at the top here, at the end of the alpha helix, aren't forming hydrogen bonds. Uh, so they're unshielded. So this is this side of the alpha helix is positively charged. Okay. So you get a, a positive uh, amino terminus of a helix and a negative uh, carboxy terminus, so C terminal, right? So you get a, a overall macroscopic dipole over the alpha helix. And a lot of times in, in a three-dimensional protein structure, you see cases where an alpha helix, um, you know, goes this way in in one string and then there's a turn and another alpha helix coming down. So you get sort of a, uh, a matching their uh, opposite dipoles on the, the two helix. The next type of secondary structure we'll discuss uh, overall are beta sheets. Okay. And the, the peptide bond is very planar and it has a, a sort of a tetrahedral geometry there at the alpha carbon. And this creates a pleated sheet-like structure. Okay. And that's a, a picture of that's kind of shown there. Okay. The backbone is held together uh, by hydrogen bonds between amides that are in different strands. Uh, side chains in a beta sheet, they alternate one facing down and the next one facing up above the sheet. So one's below the sheet, the next is going to be above the sheet. Okay, think about that in turn, how that differs from an alpha helix. The helix in, an, in a helix, you have the, the side chains on the outside of the helix, you know, kind of winding up. In a beta sheet, you're alternating side chain positions. So a side chain um, that two amino acids that are right next to each other in a beta sheet, their side chains aren't going to interact with one another. There are two types of beta sheets that are at least that we'll discuss two main types. And well, I think I should mention first that you can have a case where you have one one chain of a, a polypeptide that undergoes this conformation. We really would call that a beta strand, okay, if it's by itself. Okay. But most of the time, these beta strands interact with, you know, one or more. Uh, other beta strands, and that's when we call these beta sheets. Okay. The sheets are held together by hydrogen bonding of uh, amide and carbonyl groups, just like the alpha helix, but this time those groups are um, from, from peptide bonds of opposite strands. Okay, So not within the same strand, but strands that are, are stacked next to each other. Okay, there's two major orientations of beta sheets, and that depends on the direction of the strands within them. Okay. Parallel sheets have strands that are going the same direction, so the primary structure, the primary sequence in these are going the same direction. Anti-parallel is the opposite. The sheets have strands oriented in opposite directions. Okay. So this would be an example of a parallel beta sheet. And when you see beta strands and beta um, sheets in a crystal structure, they typically, you know, they look kind of like a ribbon. Um, um, sort of, 
going up and down, oscillating, and they have arrows on them as well. And that tells you the direction that they're going. Right? So in a parallel beta sheet, we have hydrogen bonds, but the hydrogen bonds tend to be t at an angle. Right? And because of that, they're slightly weaker than, than, um, than anti-parallel beta sheets. And the distance between, if we look at the distance between two, in this case, uh, that's that would be um, an alpha, yeah, alpha carbon. Uh, you have a, a 6.5 angstrom um, between residues. Okay, anti-parallel beta sheets, okay, they're running in opposite directions. Their hydrogen bonds are are straighter and more linear, so they're they're stronger. And the distance now between residues and an anti-parallel beta sheet is seven angstroms. Okay, so it's a little bit more um, stretched, I guess you could say, a little bit tighter. Okay. So beta strands, beta sheets are the the second main secondary structure there's also something called a beta turn and these occur frequently when strands change directions so beta strands in a beta sheet are changing direction you can think of in a in the case of an anti-parallel beta sheet right one strand goes this way and there might be Typically what you see is there's a turn right here and then the strand continues on in the opposite direction and then another turn and so forth. I mean, you could have a case where you have one strand here and then hundreds of amino acids away, there's another strand and they, they interact with each other to form a sheet. But more typically what you see is that there's these amino acids are closer in primary sequence that are in the, the beta sheet. And there's what, what are known as beta turns between the, the strands. Yeah. The beta turn makes uh, really basically a 180 degree turn over the course of four amino acids. Okay. The turn is stabilized by hydrogen bonding from carbonyl oxygen to the amide protein three residues down the sequence. Okay. There's two types of beta turns that we'll discuss, and, and one proline is in position two, and the other type glycine is in position three. Those are two very common beta turns. Okay. So the type one beta turn is where you have proline in position two, and type two beta turn is glycine in position three. Right? And you see that you have at, at amino acid one, right? And this can be, this amino acid could be anything. It, hydrogen bonds with amino acid four, right? In, in both cases. Okay. So really the ones you have to remember are proline in the second position is a type one, glycine in the third position is a type two. Peptide bonds not invo involving proline are, as we mentioned before, in the trans com configuration almost 100% of the time. Okay. For peptide bonds that have proline, uh, only um, most of them are still in the trans configuration, but about 6% are in the cis conformation. And those that are in the cis conformation, uh, most of them are in beta turns. And so when we look here at proline, so here's the alpha carbon, the nitrogen, okay, that's making a, a cis conformation. Okay. And this is probably a better way to, to picture that. Okay, you can have trans conformation and cis conformation. 
So the cis confirmation is, is the one that's, uh, when you see that, it, it typically tells you it's in a beta turn. The determination of secondary structure is the analytical technique to, uh, there, there are ways you can look at, um, you can guess secondary structure based on sequences. And that's uh, a lot of times that's typical. If you have a sequence of a protein, you can compare it to the sequences of other known proteins that you know their structure and, and kind of um, uh, guess or, or model the protein that way of what you think the, the secondary structures and it will be uh, an analytical technique to determine what secondary structure there are in, in proteins uh, is called circular dichroism or CD. Okay. And what CD does is it measures uh, an absorption difference between left and right circular, circularly polarized light. Okay. So it's a, it uses polarized light, and then how the protein is interacting with that polar, polarized light tells you if there's an alpha helix there or a, a beta sheet primarily. Okay. All right. So let's look at some example data for a, a CD. Okay. In blue, this is the typical spectrum that you would see of an alpha helix. There's a um, minimum absorption, you know, around a little less than 210, okay? Somewhere between 205 and 210, there's a, a minimum. And then, again, around maybe 225-ish, okay? So you have a, a double minimum peak down here and then a, a, a maximum that's closer to you know 190 uh, wavelength up here okay so that's the the typical alpha helix T uh, typical beta confirmation it the maximum occurs a little bit longer wavelength than an alpha helix and it's a little bit um, less intense less high okay and then it, it only has one minimum down uh, around 215. So that's how you would tell those those confirmations apart. And then you have a random coil. And, and the random coil um, is completely opposite of these because its maximum is out here at the wavelengths out here, and the minimum is, is down here. Okay, so it's kind of like a if you just flipped a beta sheet over it, almost. Okay. All right, so CD, you can tell, you can look at a protein and you can... Um, if you have a, just a very small protein, uh, you can you can pick these structures out very easily. If you have a larger protein that contains a little bit of each of these structures, you can sort of deconvolute the data and fit it, and it it'll tell you how much of the protein is alpha helix, how much is is beta sheet, and how much is random. Okay. Okay. So just as an aside. Uh, Linus Pauling was involved in, in determining secondary structure, so I wanted to talk a little bit about uh, what he did. And at the turn of the century, the, the previous century, 1900s, um, people were, were shooting x-rays at, at stuff, and uh, a little bit as the century went on, um, people started to, to crystallize things and, and shoot crystals at, or x-rays at these crystals, get a diffraction pattern, and you can tell the structure of the crystal. And that was a sort of common practice. And then people started using, trying to crystallize biological molecules and doing this and trying to determine the structure of you know, DNA or of, of proteins. And so you get out, when you do that, you get this complicated diffraction pattern, okay? And somehow, uh, looking at that diffraction pattern, Pauline and his, his collaborators were able to figure out the, the structure 
the peptide bond structure and exactly how it was uh, forming in three-dimensional shape to come up with the, an alpha helix. Okay. And that's, as we've mentioned, that's very important, knowing secondary structure and the three-dimensional structure of a protein really tells you its, its function. Okay. So that was the first secondary structure that was determined in, in proteins. And, and Pauline was actually pretty close to, to, to coming up with the double helix or the, the DNA um, double-stranded helix uh, structure as well. His, his DNA structure was a, a little bit off, but he was, he was fairly close. And this is from my, my general chemistry lecture, so it's um, kind of detailing what Linus Pauling did in, in terms of general chemistry. He was involved in coming up with the, the electronegativity scale, uh, valence bond theory. Right? Um, he actually studied, he went on um, uh, a sabbatical or kind of a, a guest um, researcher post in Europe, and he's studying under Schrodinger and Niels Bohr. And those are two giants in the field of quantum mechanics. So Linus Pauling learned a lot about quantum mechanics with, with these two people who uh, both um, won the Nobel Prize. Okay. Linus Pauling later, later on when he was running his own lab had a, a graduate student named William, William Lipscomb Okay, and he uh, actually ended up winning a Nobel Prize himself for, for doing molecular structures, determining molecular structures using NMR. Okay. And when William Lipscomb was uh, at, at Harvard, he had a student named Gareth Eaton that worked under him. And Gareth Eaton was uh, a professor at the University of Denver and I just happened to be in, in Gareth Eaton's lab. So you can see that it, it's kind of cool that even in this day and age, you can have an instructor that's fairly closely related to some of the, the giants in, in, in biochemistry and chemistry. Okay. I also bring this up because you can see how quickly the knowledge can be erased uh, in in one step. The <laughs> the knowledge can be erased in this this uh, chain. Okay. Um, next time, next lecture, we'll finish chapter four, talking about uh, tertiary structure primarily, and then some examples of quaternary structure. Okay. And then the final section uh, details protein denaturing and, and protein folding.